dark truth, heavy guns, and a secret that almost grounded a legend. The Douglas A, the 26 Invader promised unmatched speed and firepower, but early in its combat life, pilots warned of a deadly visibility flaw in the glass-nosed version that cost lives on low-level runs. You will see why crews in Europe pushed for gun-nosed conversion, why commanders insisted on tactical changes, and how a light bomber turned into one of the most feared night intruders of three wars. Gun nose and a ton of ammo, Douglas. A 26 Invader ground attack and light bomber legacy. The story begins in early 1941 at Douglas Aircraft Company in El Segundo, California, when designer Ed Heinemann and his team began shaping a new attack bomber to replace the Douglas A-20 Havoc. Their answer, the XA-26, flew for the first time on Friday, July 10, 1942 from Mines Field in Los Angeles, lifting on a laminar flow wing that cut drag and boosted speed. Test pilots Benny Howard and John F. Martin reported crisp handling and high climb, yet they also flagged that the glass-nosed Bombardier model demanded care in low-level visibility and cockpit ergonomics. The Air Corps weighed the data and pushed for two parallel noses, a Bombardier's clear nose for precision, and a solid gun nose packed with machine guns for attack. That choice would define the aircraft's shifting identity from precision light bomber to ruthless ground striker. From the start, the airframe was built for speed and survivability. A semi-monocoque fuselage blended strength and lightweight. A laminar flow wing, the same aerodynamic philosophy made famous on the P-51 Mustang, allowed high crews with reduced drag. Double-slotted flaps improved short field performance and controlled approaches. Remote-controlled dorsal and ventral turrets, each with twin M2 Browning 50 caliber guns, were slaved to a single gunner, saving weight while giving all-around defense. Under the cowlings, two Pratt and Whitney R280 double wasps delivered about 2,000 horsepower each, enough to push the invader to roughly 350 miles per hour or about 560 kilometers per hour at altitude, with a practical combat radius in the range of 600 to 800 miles, or around 960 to 1,300 kilometers, depending on load and profile. Typical bomb capacity was about 4,000 pounds, or roughly 1,800 kilograms internally, with additional external stores as needed. When configured for strafing, the gun nose could mount up to eight forward-firing 50 caliber guns, and with wing pods and bays, total fixed forward firepower could reach as many as 14 50 caliber guns. In plain language, that meant a storm of heavy rounds per second, saturating road columns, locomotives, and flat positions. Yet speed and firepower could not hide the early flaw. In the Southwest Pacific in mid-1944, the 5th Air Force put the new bomber to its first combat tests over New Guinea and western New Britain. Crews flying the clear-nosed A-26C complained that visibility, cockpit layout, and sight lines at treetop height made attack runs hazardous. The aircraft was fast and strong, but the mission profile punished any cockpit that did not give the pilot instant lateral and downward cues. Early feedback was cautious. The mystery many asked was simple. Why did a promising design stumble in its first theater? The hidden answer lay in role mismatch. The clear nose variant wanted medium altitude precision, but the theater demanded brutal low-level attacks through jungle-masked valleys and sudden weather, where a solid gun nose and pilot-centric sighting worked better. In just a moment, you will hear how Europe solved the puzzle. In late September 1944, ferry crews delivered a 26S to the 9th Air Force in England for a second evaluation. The 386th Bomb Group's 553rd Squadron flew initial test sorties from Great Dunmo in Essex. Their first missions, recorded in early September and into November 1944, used both gun nose and glass nose aircraft against rail yards, bridges, and road traffic in occupied France and the Low Countries. The result was a sharp reversal of Pacific doubts. In Europe's broader skies with layered radar control and clear navigation features, the aircraft's speed, payload, and gun concentration excelled. The 416th Bombardment Group became the first to convert fully to the A-26B gun nose, flying its first invader combat on Friday, November 17, 1944. The 409th Bombardment Group followed later that month. By early 1945, 9th Air Force invaders had flown more than 11,000 combat sorties 
and dropped more than 18,000 tons, which is over 16,000 metric tons, of bombs, while also conducting tactical reconnaissance, night interdiction, and rail cuts with minimal losses relative to output. In Italy, the 12th Air Force's 47th Bomb Group began receiving invaders in January 1945, using them to knock out German bridges and armor movements across the Po Valley. The European verdict was stark. The A-26, especially with the gun nose, was among the most efficient light bombers of the late war. Let us confront the danger again. Low-level attack remained terrifying. Flak belts near the Rhine, rail choke points in the Ardennes, and bridges feeding the Ruhr were thick with guns. Pilots like those of the 416th learned to come in fast, often around 250 miles per hour or about 400 kilometers per hour at treetop height, salvo frag bombs, and pour 50 caliber streams down the line while jinking only after release. The aircraft's laminar wing gave speed, but it could feel unforgiving at very high wing loading if a pilot tried to yank too hard at low speed. Ground fire and weather were the killers, but the cockpit layout improvements adopted during the European phase, better gunsight integration and mission-tailored noses, reduced the earlier hazard. This is where you see the hidden reason the invader's reputation rose. The type did not change its DNA as much as commanders changed how it was used. Production ramped up at Douglas Plants in Long Beach, California, and Tulsa, Oklahoma, with total wartime output reaching roughly 2,450 aircraft. The last deliveries came as the war ended, and many airframes went into storage or were converted for post-war use, but the name on the data plate would soon stir confusion. After the Martin B-26 Marauder retired from service in 1948, the United States Air Force reused the B-26 designation for the invader, which meant two very different bombers had worn the same alphanumeric at different times. Crews were careful. Paperwork spelled out whether a reference meant the Martin Marauder or the Douglas Invader. By June 25, 1950, when North Korean forces crossed the 38th parallel, the United States Air Force was short of modern attack bombers in the Far East. The B-26 Invader, in theater with the 5th Air Force, immediately stepped into a vital role. Night interdiction. In the first week of the war, invaders struck rail lines over South Korea on Wednesday, June 28, then hit Pyongyang's main airfield on Thursday, June 29. The mission set hardened into a grim routine. Under moonless skies with searchlights called arc lights slung under the fuselage and wingtip tanks adding range, B-26 hunted truck convoys and locomotives along twisting valleys where anti-aircraft guns hid at every bend. The aircraft's speed, heavy forward fire, and good single pilot workload made it the right machine for a deadly job. The numbers from Korea underline the scale of the campaign. Across tens of thousands of sorties, well over 50,000 by composite wing totals. B-26 units like the third bomb. Wing, the 17th bomb wing, and the 452nd bomb wing destroyed or claimed tens of thousands of vehicles, hundreds of locomotives, and several thousand rail cars. The aircraft flew the first American bombing missions of the war and, in a solemn bookend, also flew the last bombing mission roughly 24 minutes before the armistice took effect on Monday, July the 27th, 1953. Unit citations and decorations speak to the hard fight, but one name burns brightest in the invaders' Korean chapter, Captain John Springer. Walmsley Jr. of the 8th Bombardment Squadron, 3rd Bombardment Group, flew a B-26 on the night of Friday, September 14, 1951, near Yangdok in North Korea. He and his crew found an armed supply train in a heavily defended valley. After bombing and exhausting ammunition, Walmsley called in another invader and then made a fateful choice. Using the aircraft's powerful searchlight, he illuminated the target and held the beam steady so the incoming wingmen could set up a clean run. Doing so meant flying straight through concentrated fire without evasive jinx. He made multiple passes, soaked up the gunfire meant for the other crew, and kept the light on until the train was destroyed. His B-26 was fatally hit and crashed into the mountains. For conspicuous gallantry above and beyond the call of duty, he was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. That moment captures the invader's Korean identity, relentless, low, fast, and lethal, but with a cost borne by crews who fought at the edge of survivability. Between missions, maintainers kept the airframes alive under punishing conditions. Wings were stress-checked after heavy ordnance or rough field cycles. 
Hydraulic lines were replaced under floodlights, and remote turrets received constant alignment. The engines, those two R280 double wasps, were flown hard, often with propellers at coarse pitch to arrest speed on short recoveries to forward strips. Even with all that, pilots called the invader honest. The aircraft could be trimmed to fly hands-off at crews, but it demanded respect in combat, where asymmetric thrust from a damaged engine could yaw the nose hard at low speed. Training emphasized go-around discipline, cross-wind handling with the relatively narrow main gear track, and strict adherence to approach numbers. The mystery behind the invader's survivability was not exotic armor or secret devices. It was a balanced airframe, massive firepower, and crews who refined tactics by night after night of experience. After the Korean armistice, many invaders shifted into reconnaissance and weather roles as RB-26 and WB-26 variants, while the Navy operated a small number as JD-1 target tugs and utility aircraft. Strategic Air Command and Tactical Air Command kept the type active in various secondary duties through the late 1950s, and the Air National Guard flew invaders into the early 1970s. Some surplus airframes began new lives in civilian firefighting as air tankers, their strong wings and stable handling ideal for low-level slurry drops over burning hills. Then came Southeast Asia, and a transformation that pushed the airframe into a new era. In the early 1960s, covert needs led to the revival and deep modification of stored invaders. On Mark Engineering rebuilt dozens into the B-26K counter invader, later redesignated A-26A. The wings were strengthened with new spars to address fatigue. The engines received power upgrades, reversible pitch propellers, improved short field braking and turnarounds, wingtip tanks extended range, and revised cowlings improved cooling on hot low-altitude missions. Avionics included updated radios and navigation suitable for night trail hunting. In Thailand, these aircraft operated in counterinsurgency roles and along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, where they attacked truck parks, storage sites, and river crossings. Crews called them fast, responsive, and brutally effective. Yet the missions were always risky. Low-level passes and mountain passes meant that small arms and anti-aircraft fire could hit from close range. When an A-26A took damage to a wing route or engine mount, the pilot's workload spiked in seconds. The hidden reason these aircraft lasted as long as they did was careful modernization that respected the original design strengths while shoring up its weak points. The invader's fingerprints also appear in other Cold War flashpoints. In 1961, Cuban exile crews flew B-26 in the Bay of Pigs invasion, highlighting the aircraft's export appeal and the shadowed nature of Cold War air wars. Various nations operated invaders for years, including in Africa and Latin America, where their ruggedness and low-level punch suited frontier conflicts and border patrols. These episodes often carried controversy beyond the scope of a technical history, but they underscored the aircraft's long service. Let us step back and ask the core mystery that frames the invader's legacy. How did a light bomber designed in 1942 manage to serve effectively in three major wars? The answer is not a single secret, but a chain of design decisions and operational choices. The laminar flow wing gave speed and efficiency, which remained relevant in the medium altitude, medium range space for decades. The internal bay and strong wing hardpoints made the airframe flexible for bombs, rockets, and long-range tanks. The cockpit was designed for a single pilot, enabling quick training and small crew footprints. The nose could be swapped between glass and guns to suit mission demands. Remote turrets concentrated defense without the drag and crew needs of manned blisters, and the basic structure was tough, taking battle damage and rough fields with grace. However, there were trade-offs. Early glass nose visibility at extreme low level was a genuine hazard. The wing, crisp at speed, could feel sharp near stall in heavy turns at very low altitude. The landing gear track, while adequate, required careful crosswind technique. And in later life, wing spar fatigue demanded major structural renewal before more combat could be flown. None of these flaws were fatal to the concept. They were wartime hazards that crews learned to respect and engineers addressed with upgrades. The invader's European turn in late 1944 brought some of its most vivid combat tales. Imagine a dawn in November, the weather sullen over northern France, with rail yards outside Saarbrücken marked for attack. A formation of a 26B gun noses drops to just above the morning haze, each carrying clusters of small fragmentation bombs, about 100-pound class each, 
roughly 45 kilograms, coupled with rockets under the wings. The lead pilot calls the run, lines up on the switchyards, and strafes the head of a train while the bombardier toggles a stick of bombs across the junction. The roar of those two 2,000 horsepower engines fills the cockpit, the hull shuddering as the pilot rides the burst through tracers. The formation banks away at about 300 miles per hour, nearly 480 kilometers per hour, and climbs, leaving scattered fires and broken lines. Minutes later, a second element hits the bridges that feed the yard, sealing the cut. That pattern of speed, precision, and sheer volume of firepower became the invader's signature in the European winter. In Italy's Po Valley in spring 1945, the 47th Bomb Group used invaders to interdict German armor, attempting to retreat north. The missions were often in the afternoon, under broken cumulus, with the mountains showing blue beyond the plains. Pilots dropped general-purpose bombs on bridges and unleashed strafing passes on convoy heads, then circled back to smash the tail, trapping vehicles between craters. Ground controllers reported that the fast, low invaders cut movement windows to minutes, and each attack forced the enemy to abandon or hide vehicles in culverts, where later night strikes finished the job. In Korea, a typical night intruder story carries the drama of darkness. Picture a blacked-out valley near Sunshon in 1952. A B-26 rolls in at about 150 feet, or around 46 meters, the pilot peering at a faint road line through dim cockpit light. The navigator watches a Loran return and a stopwatch. Suddenly, the rear gunner calls trucks ahead. The pilot snaps on the searchlight, and the beam turns night into harsh white daylight across a line of trucks. Tracers rise from the valley. The cockpit fills with the crack of passing rounds, and the pilot pushes the nose just a hair down to keep speed. The forward guns blaze, the rockets streak, and then the bombs thud into the turnout ahead of the convoy. The light clicks off, the aircraft yaws from a gust, then the pilot brings it around for a second pass. The danger never softens. The engines howl. The crew hears the eerie whistle of air over the wing roots, and the pilot fights the urge to pull too hard. On recovery to Kunsan, the aircraft lands heavy, brakes cook, and the crew walks across tarmac smelling of oil and cordite. Multiply that scene by thousands, and the scale becomes real. In Southeast Asia, the counter-invader carried a different rhythm. Late-night operations from Thai bases targeted the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos, where trucks moved under jungle canopy. The A-26A's stronger wings and reversible propellers mattered at short, humid fields. Crews arranged their loads with clusters of high-explosive bombs, flares, and sometimes gun pods. Runs were often made at low altitude to catch trucks, where the canopy opened at river crossings. The narrative repeated, flash of light, rush of engines, short, brutal bursts, and then a scissor away to avoid concentrated fire. These missions wore the aircraft hard. Maintenance crews inspected spars and skins for fatigue after high G pulls and fast low recoveries. The fleet stayed viable because structural renewal had anticipated these stresses. There is also a quieter legacy. After military retirement in the early 1970s, the invader found new life in the hands of restorers and museum teams. The commemorative Air Force and other groups returned several to airworthy condition. At air shows across North America, crowds watched an A-26 lift and circle with the polished rhythm of its double WASP radials, then make a clean pass with landing gear down and the bomb bay doors cracked open for a glimpse of the past. The aircraft's presence carries a sober tone. Its lines are sleek, but the stories it holds are heavy. Veterans who once flew or maintained invaders hear those engines and remember night skies and long debriefs. That memory and respect keep the invader an icon of aviation history, not as a boastful champion, but as a reliable, adaptable tool that did hard work in dangerous places over three decades.